It's all yours. Well, folks, welcome. I'm just standing in. Uh, uh, Dr. Raj, unfortunately, is home taking care of her family who seem to be coming down with uh, some variant of COVID. So hopefully they're okay. Um, and she sends her apologies. Uh, just a quick word about the Corner Society. And uh, we are about to start our winter hiatus and we'll next convene, I believe, on February the 15th. Uh, for what looks to me to be a very exciting evening. Um, tonight, uh, delighted uh, to have David Cantor here. Uh, and I think you are going to do an intro, which will be lovely. So, uh, and the usual plea for money. So as always, <laughs> if you can join the society, uh, uh, if you, the Division of Health Humanities, University of Rochester is managing it. So if uh, you are able to help us out financially and to join, it would be wonderful. So you're on. A very brief picture. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Brief <laughs> I was going to promise the bag, but I'm uh, Ted Brown, and I'm standing up for McCall to do the introduction of our speaker tonight. You can see on the screen if you're in the room, and you can see on the screen or your slides if you're uh, zooming in remotely. So you know the name of our speaker, the name of the talk, and his current titles, which is a great relief to me because I don't want to try to pronounce that in Spanish. But I will pronounce in Spanish some of his prior achievements and positions. And I'll tell you a little bit about that for just a few minutes. He, before taking his current positions, was a historian in the Division of Cancer Prevention at the National Institute, well, at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. And that was just the last of a succession of important positions he held in Bethesda at both the NIH and various of his institutes and at the National Library of Medicine. So let me just name a couple of those titles. He was historian in the office of the National Institutes of Health. He was acting director of the Office of History at the NIH. He was also deputy director and senior research historian in the Office of History of the NIH and served for about a decade as a historian in the History of Medicine Division of the National Library of Medicine. And in that connection, since I was a close colleague with Liz Fee, who directed that uh, division, worked together with David on several projects and was a wonderful collaborator. Before that, that's a long career, but before that he had, I think an even longer career in England. So some of the positions in reverse chronological order, just to give you a taste of it, he was a research fellow in the Department of History and Economic History at Met Manchester Metropolitan University. He was a lecturer and senior lecturer at Sheffield University and then a series of other positions and visiting fellowships in the United States, but it's several positions, mostly in Sheffield and Manchester in England, which makes perfect sense because he received his PhD in 1987 from the University of Lancaster, who was in a topic in the history of medicine. He has many, many publications, many successful grant applications, many honors and awards. And as I count, he has edited six books. I'll name the first three, but I'll put special emphasis on the last three for reasons that will become obvious. So by title, the books that he has edited over about a 20 year span include Reinventing Hippocrates, Cancer in the 20th Century, Meat, Medicine and Human Health in the 20th Century, several of these with co-editors and collaborators. But then the last three, as I count them, unless I'm missing something, one called Stress, Shock, and Adaptation in the 20th Century. It's published in 2014. Another called Health Education Films in the 20th Century in 2018. And his most recent, Cancer Research and Educational Film at Mid-Century, The Making of a Movie Challenge, Science Against Cancer, just out this year. What these last three books have in common, I'm very proud to say, is they're all published by the University of Rochester Press History of Medicine series. And so we have a very happy consumer and uh, published author at the University of Rochester series. His talk tonight focuses on his latest book, and he will explain his particular take on it. With great pleasure, I introduce 
stuff is able to buy tools. <laughs> That's your talk. I don't want to say that. <laughs> I could mind it. <laughs> so uh, that would that would have been a, an interesting start to the talk. But well, well, thank you so much for that generous in introduction, Ted. Oh, I shouldn't get too far away from the microphone, so I probably can't move too far. Um, uh, and, and thanks to Mikhail. I wish I could meet you, uh, and and to the Corner Society for inviting me. So it's a it's a wonderful pleasure. I've only been to Rochester twice before. Uh, and um, uh, as I hope to mention in, in this, the book is about a film that was actually partly shot here in Rochester, a strong memorial, and, uh, and at the University of Rochester as well, I believe. Okay, so as I said, many thanks for giving me, uh, enough, uh, for, for, for inviting me to this. I'd like to use this as an opportunity really to reflect on, on the role of, audiences in research communication. And this is in part it's because it's a story that I tell in the book that, uh, about the film Challenge Science Against Cancer. It's also in part because it's a story of my own experience of writing the book. So there are parallel stories to be told of the subject matter of the book and of the writing of the book itself. Part of the story I tell in the book is of how cancer communications and film were shaped by audiences. And my own experience of actually writing the book about audiences reveals how the book itself was to some extent shaped by the audiences I was, I, 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 I was, I, I, I was uh, appealing to. The parallels between the subject matter of the book and the writing of the book are, are linked institutionally. When I started my research, I was employed by one of the two organizations that had funded the film, the subject of the book. And there were similarities between my own situation and that of the sponsors and the makers of the film. Just as the sponsors and makers of the film in the 1940s and 50s um, found themselves engaging with audiences within the organization that employed them, that had the power to shape their ongoing project. So I, in the 2000s, early 2000s, found myself engaging with audiences in the same organization who as my employers and higher up the administrative tree also had the power, if they chose to use it, to shape my ongoing project. So in what follows, I'm going to try and tell a double story and we'll see whether it works or not. The first is about the role of audiences in shaping the film I discuss in the book, and the other is how similar audiences help to shape the writing of the book and the connections between the two. It's a story of the varied audiences encountered and engaged with during the development of the film and the book and how they shape these two projects. It is, I think, not so much a story of communication in the sense of a message simply going out from the speaker or the researcher or the writer to in one direction uh, to the um, to, 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 to the world, but of a series of conversations, interchanges, exchanges, negotiations between the communicator, me and the makers of the film, and various audiences during ongoing projects that helped to shape the final outcomes, and that continued in the 1950s after the release of the film, and I hope in the 2020s after the publication of my volume. It's a little early since the volume has only, has only just appeared to know whether uh, conversations will continue. To tell these twin stories, I'll draw on the idea uh, developed by some other historians. Oops, nothing has moved. We have a problem here. There's no movement. Just these? Yep, you got it. Yeah, that's what I pressed.
I should be doing that. Yeah, maybe you could just use the mouse to click okay. on that little. Okay, there I'll do go. that. There you go. Perfect. Right. And we lost the code. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Tell these twin. Uh, I'll draw on the idea of audiencing that has been developed by some other um, historians um, to, to refer to, which in this case I take to refer to how audiences shape the research process, its communication and reception. In short, the idea seeks to portray audiences not as passive, but as active participants in the research and communication process, not just the passive recipients of outcomes such as a film or a book. It further suggests that communication does not move in one direction from communicator to audience, nor that there is only one audience involved. Instead, it assumes that there may be a multitude of audiences and that communication sort of goes in many directions to and from communicators and their various audiences and between audiences, sometimes without the sort of the original communicator being there, um, uh, in, in a sort of iterative process that can shape that can shape the research that's, under, that, that, that's, uh, that's ongoing. It's a conversation, in other words, or an interchange between the author and the communicator and the various audiences that begins at the beginning of the research press process, not just after publication or release. So here I want to reflect on how both the film and the book about the film were shaped by various audiences over their gestations and to suggest that it can be very unclear who is the audience, the communicator or those that they engage with. So, ah, Two final introductory notes. The first concerns the term research. It's a term that I use to cover uh, the practice of historical research and the research practices of filmmakers and communicators or, and specialists in health communication. These two forms of research were undertaken in part in the United States major cancer research agency, the National Cancer Institute. But this research was not the research normally associated with that institute, with an institute, often basic clinical epidemiological research that, that, yeah, that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Likely audiences, real or imagined, of referees, journal editors, professional colleagues, Congress, amongst others, did shape this biomedical research. But that's not the subject matter of this paper. The research I describe here is that necessarily either to write a history of that agency, as I attempted to do, or in the case of my subject matter, to communicate what was being done in the laboratory or the clinic or in the field, the research that went into the making of the film and the educational and publicity materials around it. The second introductory note concerns the term audiences. And I'm going to refer to audiences in two ways. One is as a sort of imaginative construct, almost a fantasy at times. And the other is as an interlocutor, the people with whom the makers of the film and I interacted. The two overlapped in that we both, myself and those I write about, found it could be very difficult to differentiate between our imaginings of an audience and those we interacted with there was often a need to interpret, to imagine perhaps, the meanings and agendas of those that we engaged with. Put another way, interlocutors could shape our imaginings of them as audiences, just as our imaginings likely shaped interlocutor responses. And it's often this sort of complex of imagination and interaction that structured how audiences, audiences shaped research, both that of myself and that of my subjects. So let me start with the subject matter of the film itself. The book is about a US Canadian film that sought to persuade young scientists in both countries to think of cancer research as a career at a time in the late 1940s and early 1950s when funding for cancer research was expanding really as never before. The problem was that this expansion was threatened by 
poor recruitment of new young scientists into the field. Too many were tempted to go into industry. Pay was better. Or they went into atomic physics, which had higher prestige, uh, higher status after the explosion of the atomic bombs in Japan and the hopes that the future hopes vested in atomic energy. Cancer research, by contrast, was a very different situation. It was dogged by poor pay, by a frustrating grant system, and by a lack of opportunities for researchers. Cancer research at that time had a reputation as a dead end field. So cancer agencies in the US and Canada, the US National Cancer Institute and the Department of National, uh, Department of National Health and Welfare in Canada joined together to fund a recruitment campaign centered around a, an educational film that sought to persuade high school and college science students to go into the field. And to this end, they commissioned another organization to make the film, the National Film Board of Canada, the NFB, Canada's state-funded film producer and distributor, a pioneer of documentary and animation film, and during the, during the Second World War, a propaganda arm of the Canadian government. To look at the role of audiences in shaping the film, I'll focus first of all on the NFB, the film board filmmakers, and their imaginings of the audience of high school and college science students, future recruits, remember, to cancer research, uh, that they were tasked with reaching, and how they sought to attract them into the field of cancer research. To begin with, they seem to have had a fairly clear idea about this audience and what would appeal to it. In their view, this was an audience that made choices based on career, future financial prospects, and opportunities for successful research outcomes. It relished a challenge, and it had a thirst for knowledge. It could be excited by the possibilities opening up in cancer research, enthused by the prospect of discoveries to come, open, to humanitarian impulses to help the vulnerable patient and awed by the beauty and complexity of the body and cell. It was thus not an audience that was wholly motivated by rational considerations such as career choice or money, but by emotions of excitement, enthusiasm, awe, and a desire to know more. Filmmakers imagined that this mix of rationality, curiosity, and emotion would help to direct the audience into the field of cancer research. But they also imagined their audience in another way, as open to flattery, to those who might think of basic research in cell biology as a career, they flattered them with a world with a worldview in which they were the leaders at a time when basic research uh, into the cell and biology was coming to dominate approaches to biomedicine after the second world war they suggested that future basic scientists would figure out how the body and cancer worked clinicians slightly lower down the lower down the line would apply these insights to their patients and patients, this was the 1950s, remember, would do what they were told. Biomedical scientists were, in other words, at the peak of a hierarchy, leaders or guides to those below them. To those thinking of clinical research as a career, well, the filmmakers couldn't offer quite such a flattering portrayal of leadership, since the biomedical scientists were, of course, higher up the pecking order. Though there was the idea that biomedical scientists needed clinical researchers if they were ever to demonstrate relevance for their work. And clinical researchers, of course, had in the 1950s obedient patients below them. Both the future basic and the future clinical researcher, however, were offered the opportunity to do something humanitarian with the patient, 
the scientists, the basic scientists, perhaps in the distant future, the clinical researcher, perhaps more directly. The target audience for this film was a young, was a young audience, full of youthful idealism, the filmmakers believed, that made it possible to appeal to such humanitarian instincts. Central to the filmmakers' efforts was the idea of the character of the scientist, the phrase that was used in the film script, a, a character that the target audience was invited to emulate. In the final version of the film, this character was someone who was dedicated to research, the product of years of education and training, humbled by the immensity of the problem of cancer, but also inspired and challenged by it. Ordinary men in the gendered language of the day, but also special ones, intelligent, and given all their training, primed to make a discovery. Male scientists might be doubly married to their wives and to their research, nothing else working late at night while the wife cared for the home, as you can see here on the left. Uh, work was their life mission. Female scientists, also an audience for this film given contemporary efforts to recruit women, especially into the field of biology, uh, were never portrayed as working late into the night or leaving their husbands to care for their children, but they too were dedicated to their work even if, as early versions of the script suggested, they worried about the impact of all this work on their chances of making an impression in the dance hall. Apparently, the work of science could ruin beautiful fingernails, as one female character suggests in the script. Such an approach to audiences was largely consonant with the ideas of the founder of the National Film Board of Canada, the documentary filmmaker, John Grierson. Informed by the ideas of Walter Lippmann, the Chicago School of Sociology, amongst other influences, Grierson had long expressed a pessimism about the possibility of film, of using film, sorry, to reform what he regarded as mass society. Instead, he wanted to target select audiences, the educated, and the middle classes who might play a significant role in society, using film to reach this audience at both a rational and at an intuitive level, non-intellectual level. Challenge, the film was consistent with such a view in that it targeted not the masses, but the small group of students who it flattered as future leaders and research scientists. And it did this through dramatic sometimes spectacular scenes in the live action and animation that's it, that, that sought to appeal to its audience on both a rational and on an emotional level, as Grierson had suggested. Grierson's views echoed a broader suspicion of mass culture amongst many self-styled elites. Uh, especially in Britain, from where he originally, uh, from where he originally came, who used portrayals of the masses and the public to define their own identity as elites, where the masses and the public were construed as largely undifferentiated masses, uh, agglomerations. Uh, elites define themselves much more in terms of individuality, but the masses were defined as open to emotional manipulation. These self-styled elites like Grierson tended to define themselves as much more in, in control of their emotions. Common images of the masses and, uh, and, and, and the public compared them to animals or children in their inability to control uh, their emotions or their lack of intellectual development. Images that self-styled elites like Grierson did not rare, or very rarely apply to themselves. Many echoed Grierson's pessimism about the possibility of using mass communications to reform mass society, 
believing that it was most effective when targeted at educated and middle-class audiences, men and women like them, who might be trained to transform society. Strange as it may seem, such views found a receptive audience in the United States, in the, especially amongst the information officers at the National Cancer Institute, who similarly feared the impact of mass media uh, on, on audiences, especially those for programs for promoting cancer control rather than research, those targeted at future patients, uh, bring, to bring them into programs of early detection and treatment, for example, to programs of prevention. In their view, audiences for cancer control were really tricky entities. They were easily swayed, like related entities like such as the masses or the public, by the mass media and advertising. And in some ways, this was not necessarily such a bad thing for the NCI information officers, since early communication experts at the NCI used the media uh, and marketing strategies to promote their agendas, promote their institutions. The problem was that the NCI and the NCI communication experts were not alone in doing this. There were countless different media with sometimes conflicting messages about cancer, which made it very difficult to control what information audiences received. Added to this was a pessimism about the capacity of audiences themselves. Audiences for NCI messages about cancer control were often seen as ignorant of this group of diseases and what could be done about them overly emotional about the disease and its treatment, alternatively, too hopeful, too fearful. And they were far too willing, information specialists believe, to invest trust in inexpert positions, in quacks, purveyors of patent medicines. In an ideal world, the NCI information officers argued, audiences should only be active insofar as they followed the advice of recognized physicians. It's a problem here. Often audiences did not know who was recognized or accepted the recognition of those that the NCI scientists rejected as experts. At the same time, betraying medical concerns about the influence of consumerism within healthcare NCI information officers also claimed that audiences often had too much faith in their own capacity to choose. They failed to see the limitations of their own knowledge and in the view of these information officers made ill-informed decisions regarding healthcare for themselves, their families and their friends. That was audiences for cancer control, for bringing, recruiting patients. Audiences for recruiting scientists, however, were often treated differently. Unlike those for cancer control, they were not treated as ignorant and emotive, or, or rather I should say they were not treated as ignorant and emotive in the same way. They might not have had the knowledge of a research scientist, but there was hope for this in the future after sufficient training, oops, after sufficient training, uh, something that was not the case generally for audiences for cancer control. And their emotions, their hopes, their enthusiasm, their desires, and so on. These were generally regarded more positively than those of audiences for cancer control, where such emotions were all too often dissuaded patients from seeking care, they could drive a scientist into seeking a career in cancer research. This audience of student scientists was akin to Grierson's elite of middle-class viewers of documentary film, the future elite of bright, curious students who could be flattered, as the film tried to do, as future leaders people who would create the fundamental knowledge that would advance understandings of the cell and cancer 
shape clinical practice and save future patients. The hard fact of the sponsored film was that the NCI was not interested in recruiting every student into cancer research. Only the select few that showed promise, certainly not those who were less curious, who were less bright. This created a bit of a problem though for the filmmakers. Such efforts to discriminate, uh, these efforts to discriminate between different audiences. The filmmakers remember were tasked with producing a film for use in the classroom. And they recognized that school and college students varied in knowledge and curiosity. Where sponsors, the NCI, the Department of National Health and Welfare in Canada, saw the ideal audience for the film as one full of knowledge and curiosity, likely recruits to science. The filmmakers recognized that in the classroom, it was not always possible to separate the bright and the curious from those less well endowed. And that it would be too expensive and probably impracticable to make different films for different audiences. So they did eventually make uh, at least five different versions of this film. So filmmakers were faced with the task of trying to reach a range of students across the spectrums of knowledge and curiosity at the same time as they were being tasked with recruiting the cream of the crop. So to reach this audience, the filmmakers adopted a range of approaches. Uh, there are many in the film, but I'll, I'll highlight two, two animation approaches. The first, was that they sought to educate by creating what we can call vi visual animation threads that moved from images that the filmmakers thought would be easily recognizable but to most students at all, through those that they felt would not be so easily recognizable. A good example of this is the conception to fetus sequence, which uses a variety of images some of which, like the cell or the fetus, would the filmmakers believe to be familiar to many students from their textbooks or perhaps from other films, others of which would likely not be familiar. The unfamiliar parts of the film gaining their meaning to the extent that they're sort of sandwiched between more familiar images in the film sequence. In such ways, the animators hope to stimulate student curiosity and knowledge about the parts of the biology that were unfamiliar, or at least not to lose the less, less knowledgeable or curious. The problem, as this suggests, was that the filmmakers recognized that not every student would be curious and that some of the less knowledgeable might be lost despite the efforts to reach them, unable to identify what was going on on screen. So another approach adopted by the animators was to use spectacle to capture the eyes and attention of the viewer by demonstrations of the beauty and enormous scale of this miniature world of the cell, or by evocations of other popular themes such as space travel. Such an approach was consistent to some extent with Grierson's desire to reach audiences at the non-intellectual level to create what he regarded as a mature citizenry, an elite able to lead others and reform society. But it was also useful as a sort of pacifier to keep the less curious, the less knowledgeable and bored students from disrupting the classroom. One of the ways in which animators sought to create spectacle was to draw an analogy between the world of the cell and the world of outer space. The exploration of the biologist being akin to the exploration of the space traveler, passing constellations, not of stars, but of parts of the cell, some seemingly at great distance. Students, the hope was, will be moved by the sheer scale and the beauty of this tiny world or universe and the excitement 
of moving like a space traveler in vast reaches like outer space. Just as then contemporary science fiction films took viewers to mysterious otherworldly places in outer space to which they otherwise could not travel and so helped to encourage uh, support for the budding space program. So the makers of this film sought to use the portrayal of the world as the cell as akin to outer space to take viewers to mysterious otherworldly places within the cell to which they otherwise could not travel, and so to encourage support for the budding cancer, uh, for the budding field of cancer research. And of course, to keep the duller students from drifting off or disturbing the teaching. At least that's what the filmmakers hoped. So, so far I've spoken as if there was only really one audience, perhaps varied in its composition, an imagined audience of science students for which the filmmakers undertook research. They investigated the biology of the cell, the psychology of student audiences, the visual themes that might appeal to them, how they might be presented, and how this opened up other opportunities for conversation such as between the animators and artists, such as Pavel Celici, from whom they drew visual inspiration. Then there was the research into locations for filming the live action sequences, how one should travel there, the equipment that would be needed, and which professional actors might be tempted to act in the film. It was a blend, in other words, of administrative and creative research much of it undertaken in conversations, in letters and phone calls, the hiring of an expert in medical illustration, discussions with accountants, travel agents and more, and some reading and experimentation on techniques of filming and animation. <clears throat> As this suggests, the audiences with which the filmmakers came into contact were not only imagined, Many were interlocutors as well. Most of these people were within sponsoring agencies or the film board itself and some other organizations and individuals who were involved in the production of this film. In fact, until the release of the film itself, there appears to have been little or no conversation with the audience with which the filmmakers were officially tasked with reaching science students. Nor do there seem to have been any systematic surveys undertaken in the classroom on the characteristics of the student audience, their interests and reactions of specialists in the field. This despite the fact that audience research by psychologists, sociologists, marketing specialists, and others have been employed since almost the beginning of health education films in the 1910s. Instead, the interests and reactions of students were determined in large part in conversations, correspondence with the sponsors and others about this potential audience of students, and perhaps through some reading as well. This is what constituted audience research, at least for this film, a very informal process, full of conversations over the phone and in corridors and dinners, over drinks and so on, letters back and forth, pages opened on audiences for educational film, alongside the meetings undertaken during periodic reviews of the script and various cuts of the film, all informed by the experience of the filmmakers with other NFB film board educational films, uh, that of other specialists in medical and health educationals that were brought into the, into the project, and that of information officers at the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and the Canadian Department of National Health and Welfare on what one official called the cancer public, apparently a very different public to the public that the NFB filmmakers were used to engaging with. This informal form of audience research also served another purpose for filmmakers. It helped them to understand not only the student audience they were tasked with reaching, 
but other also to uh, understand other important audiences as well. Notably within the sponsoring agencies. In other words, talking to scientists, uh, administrators and information officers in these agencies about student audiences was also a form of audience research into the likely response of scientists, administrators and information officers in these agencies themselves. As their paymasters, the filmmakers had to pay special attention to audiences within the sponsoring agencies. And they, the filmmakers, constantly try to divine their intentions and assess their meanings, uh, assess the meanings of their comments and suggestions, not least to keep them on board with the project. A further point, as it was often unclear who the audience was in these interchanges, those in the NFB, the film board, or those in the sponsoring agencies. Since NFB filmmakers were as much audiences to the sponsoring agencies as these agencies were to the NFB, conversations going to and fro and shaping the research, and sometimes constituting the research that went into the film. The film had started off as a purely Canadian production. There weren't any Americans involved to begin with. So the NFB listened to the complaints of the Canadian sponsors. And one of their chief complaints was that Canadian scientists who had been tempted to better paid positions outside of the country, notably in the United States, which had a much bigger uh, cancer program than the Canadians could afford. And a subtle reference to this was included in the first version of the script. Then the Americans joined as co-sponsors. So the NFB took account of its new audience and unsurprisingly, the concerns about Canadian scientists, however subtly put, disappeared, the, the disappearing south of the international border were removed from the script. At the same time, there is evidence that the sponsors listened to the film board especially their advice on some of the imaginative aspects of the film and the need to move away from dealing with audiences of, of uh, science students from a purely didactic approach. You have to entertain as much as you have to teach. The problem though, for the NFB when they're dealing with the sponsors was that their interlocutors in the sponsoring agencies often spoke with more than one voice. There were multiple audiences within the sponsoring agencies that had to be addressed. On the US side, the NCI was a warren of fiefdoms, headed by the director of the NCI, with subordinate directors below him and subordinate subordinates below them. And there were similar hierarchies within the Department of National Health and Welfare as well. For those on the lower rungs of the hierarchy, including those who were responsible for the film, such as the information officers within the uh, NCI and within the Department of National Health and Welfare, their audiences were often those above them to whom they at least paid public loyalty and upon whom they depended for goodwill and support. And they constantly, constantly sent the NFB, the filmmakers, reports on the confusion of voices coming from those above them, above them in the hierarchy. Some such voices promoted one scientific specialty, generally that of the speaker. Others complained that other specialties were given too much emphasis. Generally, not the specialty of the speaker. And others promoted themselves or brought ideas to the film that really did not reflect the variability of scientific practice. And there were concerns about, among its administrators, scientists and physicians, about the reactions of certain other audiences to the film. Anti-vivisectionists, for example. They worried uh, how anti-vivisectionists would respond to scenes of animal experimentation, for example. Patients, how would patients respond to, put, <coughs> excuse me, to portrayals of surgery or of tumors? 
So there was a sort of complex of audiences here, and filmmakers had not only to react to how they themselves imagined this audience of science students, but also had to react to the ways in which the sponsors themselves also imagined this audience, which was not necessarily the same as that of the filmmakers. Now, for the filmmakers, scientists could <coughs> be a difficult bunch. Not all were in favor of producing a film, but once the go-ahead was given, few could really resist, excuse me, telling, telling, uh, telling the filmmakers how to do their job. Even if they really understood very little about what made a film work. They could be obsessed with scientific accuracy to the extent of weighing down the narrative with dull, plodding facts, leading the filmmakers at times to plead for poetic license, even as they put it to the borderline of scientific inaccuracy, or to make something that might inspire students. The scientists were also worried about the human foibles that the filmmakers incorporated into the film. Foibles such as vanity, self-seeking, or the temptations of flattery or money, all of which appeared in some early versions of the script. For this reason, and partly also for filmic ones as well, many of these foibles were removed from later versions of the film. <laughs> Excuse me, the vanity of the woman concerned about her broken fingernails, for example, did not make it into the final sequence. <clears throat> a scene in which a scientist <clears throat> basks briefly in the flattery and adulation of his peers before catching himself, <clears throat> and scenes which suggested that scientists might be tempted by money. Money was such a tricky thing. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. Sponsors and the filmmakers <coughs> recognized <coughs> that it was necessary to the middle class life to which many students were believed to aspire. <coughs> but scientists wanted their profession to be represented as rising above their desire for it. And sponsors could not promise much more anyway certainly not enough to compete with the salaries in industry. <clears throat> These comments on the internal audience for the film provide a lead in to the second part of this talk, which is about the story of the book about the film. But the early, early audience for the project that became the book were the successors to the NCI information officers that had overseen the movie. The book started by chance in around, probably around 2001, when Nancy Brun, who was then the senior member of the NCI's Office of Cancer Communications, popped into my office one day. I was working at the NCI as a historian there to show me a scrapbook um, <clears throat> that, about a publicity campaign for a film that the NCI had released in 1950 called Challenge Science Against Cancer. Now, neither of us knew much about this film. Well, to be, to be frank, I knew nothing about this film. Nancy obviously knew a little bit about it, but the scrapbook demonstrated a significant effort to promote this, this unknown movie with a wealth of primary sources um, uh, between its covers. Nancy had written a, a master's thesis on the history of science or STS, science technology studies, I, I forget which. And she just loved all the documentation contained in the scrapbook and really had a historian's eye for, a, for an interesting source. And we spent time leaking through the pages. We discussed its significance and what it told us about the early history of cancer communications at the NCI. So conversations went to and fro between me and Nancy we each informed the other. Nancy was in fact my first audience for the project that would eventually become the book. Indeed, it was really unclear at this point who the audience was in these interchanges, me listening to Nancy or Nancy listening to me. 
we were both audiences to the other, both shaping each other's thoughts. Just as the filmmakers and information officers in Nance's predecessor office had also been audiences to each other. But in my case, it was just a very informal process. Nancy ran the budget for my salary through her office, but our conversations really never felt like a review. They were never really a conversation. <clears throat> I should say that Nancy was an exception in cancer communications at the time, uh, and at least within, within the NCI, maybe things have changed. So when she announced her retirement, she was replaced by another person who had really very little interest in history or the informal back and forth conversations I'd had with Nancy. Now it was still true that the successor and I were audiences to each other. As the person holding my contract, I really had to listen to her and she for her sins had to listen to me. It was not however a productive relationship, uh, like the, likely for her and certainly for me. Unlike the film, which was constantly monitored by other NCI administrators and scientists, interested in the project that eventually became the book whose cover you just saw, more or less evaporated with the new regime. It was increasingly clear to me that NCI specialists, as, they, as it had been reconstituted at, uh, in cancer communications uh, at the NCI, would not be my main audience, uh, at least at that time, nor the scientists at the NCI who often just seemed perplexed at the idea of the subject. So the project continued and I reported on what I was doing in my periodic meetings, much as the filmmakers reported to their sponsors. But unfortunately, the sense of engagement that I've had with Nancy just disappeared. If this new audience shaped the project, it was not in the idea of the realm of ideas or approaches or sources as it had been with Nancy. Rather, it was as my overseer, I had to show that it didn't interfere with the stuff I was really paid to do, which was not this. Now, part of the reason for this turn of events is that history is it's really a marginal activity within the NCI. It might be occasionally promoted by a senior administrator like Nancy, who's willing to push funding in its direction. History is really cheap as compared to most other NCI research activities, but most are not willing to provide anything more, most administrators at this are not willing to provide anything more than a benevolent smile. To most, it's a largely irrelevant activity, unfortunately, certainly not crucial to the future of the NCI or groups within it, such as cancer communications in the way that the film was often portrayed. The film had largely disappeared from the NCI catalogues by the 1960s and was all but forgotten, except for Nancy, of course, by the time I got interested in it. So likely people wondered why interest in it should be revived after so many years. Its message was no longer relevant. Its animation was crude by the standards of the 2000s. And its storytelling is a little clunky compared to the slick videos that the NCI was out at that time. So the message seemed to be time to move on. At least that seemed to be the view. That seemed to be the view. So the projects were very different. The project that became the book was something I researched largely on my own, with some help from Nancy. Film in its package, by contrast, was a huge project undertaken by teams within the NCI, the Department of National Health and Welfare, the Film Board, and some other organizations, all carrying out the research necessary for making the film and its promotion. The research for the book project largely ran under the radar of the NCI, which mainly ignored it as long as it did not interfere with my other duties that I'd agents to. The film, by contrast, was one of the largest public education expenditures of 1949-50 and was the focus of intense scrutiny by scientific, uh, scientists and administrators at the NCI, where most scientists and administrators at best expressed puzzlement about the uh, project that would become the book. Their predecessors were hugely invested in the film, which promised a solution to key problems in the post-war expansion of cancer research and to the future of information services at the NCI. Unlike the film, there was 
<clears throat> no multimedia campaign to promote the book, the project that became the book, or indeed an international launch, um, uh, an international launch with the Governor General of Canada, the United Nations, and various uh, US and uh, Canadian government agencies in attendance. I was shocked, shocked at this neglect by my publishers. <laughs> <laughs> As regards international audiences, both the book and the film were subject to review within the agency that, uh, uh, that, that supported them, ensuring that internal audiences had opportunities to hear how the projects were going and perhaps to insert their own views on how, it might, how they might proceed. But they worked in very different ways. In the case of the film, because of the intense interest in it, Internal audiences of senior scientists and administrators were constantly consulted. They read the various versions of the script. They saw early cuts of the film, and they were not suggest as shy about suggesting changes in themes, despite their lack of knowledge about what might work cinematically or the costs, indeed, of making a change. A review and approval process was built into the production of the film, intended to ensure the involvement of these senior people not least because their approval was crucial to the future of information services at the NCI, only recently instituted a couple of years before within that agency and struggling at the time for recognition. So conversations continued. Scientists, information officers and filmmakers, all audiences to each other. By contrast, because my book was largely flew under the radar of the NCI, there was very little interest in shaping its outcome. No one read early versions of the manuscript at the NCI, other people did. And, and except, except for Nancy, no one thought to suggest approaches, sources, or themes. Most, I would guess, seemed baffled and content to let the historian carry out this strange side project. There was a review process of sorts, but not of the form, intensity, or systematic character that had been used for the film, which meant I had a lot more flexibility to carry out the research I wanted. We might have been audiences to each other, but very little my overseer said shaped this project, and likely little I said shaped the then go ongoing programs of council communication. But marginality can be valuable where it allows flexibility of research, even if it may leave a project vulnerable to changing institutional priorities. What we and those behind the film, what, what we, those behind the film and myself shared, however, was a, was a sort of marginal position within the NCI, both the film Although the film was presented as central to the NCI's efforts to expand research in the 1950s, in fact, the communication specialists were quite vulnerable. As I say, they had only recently been recruited to create a systematic program of public education and relations. Previously, it had been largely carried out on a more or less ad hoc basis, not entirely, but more or less. And while they were protected by the director of the NCI at the top and some other senior figures, these information specialists were in fact quite marginal to other parts of the NCI, including its research side, which was then coming to dominate the agency and was the side of the, um, of, of, of the agency that challenge itself, the film, was intended to transform. Indeed, at times, the information officers at the NCI, their dependence on an outside agency, the film board, and in Canada, heightened anxiety about their status, for they feared that this was a one-off film for the film board, and they might be tempted just to ignore the demands of the scientists. The NFB might have been marginal to the biomedical scientists at the NCI, but it was not dependent on them in the long term, unlike the information officers at the NCI who would be there long after, the, after this individual contract had ended. So while the work of the information officers at the NCI was shaped by audiences, it was also shaped by external audiences whom they constantly advised on the making of the film. It was a continual struggle trying to balance the demands of each and so much work 
which only came to an end when the first director of information of, uh, of the information office at the NCI, Dallas Johnson, who you saw in the previous slide, uh, left the NCI and the film was released. The film itself really had only a short run at the center of edu NCI educational efforts. And that is in part because that's really the fate of most educational films that are made. All the work finishes three or four years later. Most of these films are not being shown much at all. But also, I think because of new agendas, work regimes and people and priorities within the NCI itself, which meant that Challenge, the film, was soon displaced as a focus of educational activities there. It's, it's on this issue of marginality that I'll conclude. In an influential paper published in 1928, the Chicago school sociologist Robert Park introduced the idea of the marginal man. Yes, it's the gendered language of the day again. He writes that this marginal man is a cultural hybrid, a man living and sharing intimately in the cultural life and traditions of two distinct peoples, never quite willing to break, even if he were permitted to do so with his past and with his traditions and not quite accepted. Now, Park is, of course, referring to immigrants to the urban centers of the United States, but his comments, I think, also capture something of the position of marginal occupational groups, such as historians, information officers, and other groups within a biomedical agency like the NCI, where their marginality is essentially double. They are marginal in, they're generally lower in the hierarchical structures of the NCI than the biomedical scientists who constituted its core, and marginal in their approaches and assumptions are often quite different to those of biomedical scientists, and their precarity can be exacerbated by external groups upon whom they depend, as the information officers' precarity was exacerbated by their dependence to some extent on the film board in Canada. All these marginal groups, the information officers, in uh, historians and others, as I say, uh, were in Park's words, not quite accepted. But their reluctance to give up the traditions of their occupations, their approaches, their assumptions and cultures, despite their subordination to uh, those at the center of the NCI. The, uh, the, uh, the, but they were reluctant to give up their uh, traditions of these occupations, despite their subordination to others at the NCI. In such circumstances, the cultivation of audiences within the NCI and perhaps with other, with, within other agencies as well, can be fraught as researchers struggle to reconcile the norms of their own profession with those of the agencies for whom they work. Thank you very much. We have time. We have time for questions. I think there may be some questions from those who have been uh, attending remotely. Perhaps you can recognize those favorites from where you are. Uh, if not, we'll go to the audience and we're here. I, I see no questions in the chat so yeah. far. Um, well, perhaps some will. Perhaps some will pop in. Later. Anyone in the room here would like to ask a question and pursue a part? I will, um, I'll just point out that we have the book here. Okay. Yes, so um, my name is Sonia Kane. I'm with the University of Rochester Press that published this wonderful book and I brought a copy. So if people want to come up and look at it, um, and we also have um, flyers that you can take home and if you'd like to order it at a very, very steep discount. Even though it's, it is it is available open access, as I'm sure David pointed out, but we know that some people like to have a book in their hands or two. So this was a joint US Canadian production, I gather. Yes, yes. Is that an unusual story? This degree of cooperation? Um Yes and no. I mean, there, there are other examples of it. Um, I mean, for the Canadians, in particular for the film board, I, I should stay with the microphone, uh, for the Canadians, especially for the film board, 
Uh, this was actually part of an effort on their part, to uh, the film board's part, to develop uh, what it called co-production deals, international co-production deals. Basically, the film board was in a lot of uh, uh, financial difficulty after the Second World War. It was also in a lot of political difficulty for various reasons. Uh, and they were looking for alternative sources of funding. So uh, when, the, when the Department of National Health and Welfare comes to them in 1948, I think, uh, and suggests that they produce a film on cancer research for, to recruit scientists into the field, the film board goes, sort of goes, aha! They say produce a script of using the Canadian money, which they then hawk to the Americans uh, as a way of suggesting if uh, that if they bring in some money as well, they can make a better film than they could make with the with the money that the Canadians have brought in. Uh, the Canadians have put in twenty thousand dollars. I don't know whether it I assume Canadian dollars. Um, uh, the Americans came in with a similar amount, so basically they were doubling the amount of money that they had on the film. And actually, the film overran budgets uh, budgets by a little bit as well, so they actually had to. Uh, increase the amount that uh, that they that they, they they gave to this film. Um, so the film board saw this as a way of uh, as, as as a way of securing funding for for films. They did do some other uh, productions as well. Uh, not all of which were co-funded. For example, before slightly before this um, was released. There was a series of three films called the Mel Mental Mechanisms films, which were produced by the Film Board of Canada, um, uh, basically uh, exploring various issues, various issues of psychological and mental health um, that were extremely well regarded in the United States. And I think that helped uh, to, for the Film Board to secure funding for, for this particular film, but also for some other films as well, uh, funded uh, jointly with, uh, often jointly with the, with the Department of National Health and Welfare. The Department of National Health and Welfare is incredibly interested in film at this time. Uh, and so is willing to, and is working very closely with the uh, with, 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 with the film board to produce these films. I, I, I should also say that the ways in which Educational films are made in Canada and the ways in which they're made in the United States are very different. Um, gen uh, often, um, not, uh, in, in Canada, it's dominated by the National Film Board of Canada, which is a government funded agency. In the US, these educational, health educational medical training films uh, um, tend to be produced unless they're made by doctors themselves, which unfortunately tend to be very bad, bad films, but um, uh, tend, 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 tend to be made by commercial agencies, either small companies that had been set up during or after the Second World War, uh, that specialized in educational and industrial films amongst others, or sometimes uh, special sections of larger um, uh, uh, commercial film agencies, uh, for example, Disney gets involved in educational films uh, during this during this period. Um, uh, film uh, companies like uh, United Productions of America, you might remember Mr. Magoo, who made Mr. Magoo. Uh, they get very involved in um, in uh, health and in industrial films at this time. So there's a sort of mix of sort of specialist of uh, uh, of commercial organizations making educational films and sections within entertainment within the entertainment film industry and that different is is a is a very different setup to the way it works in Canada so i think for the nci when they're beginning to make films like this they're just seeing it as an, as as, as I, 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 the NFB, the, the the film board, as just one of another uh, another series of organisations that is making films. They could have gone to other uh, other other film organisations had they been interested in making this film with them, uh, but uh, they wouldn't have had the Canadian money to make the to make uh, the, 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 the uh, which basically doubled what budget the NCI was also willing to put into this. 
Um, so there, were, there, 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 was, there was a bit of happenstance with this particular film, but um, uh, there were uh, uh, many other organizations making films at this time. So this, yes, there were, there, there were collaborations, other collaborations with the Canadians, but the, the Americans was, were, were funding so many different types of films from so many different agencies that, this, that, that uh, it, it sort of gets a little bit swallowed. Um, that, that these international collaborations by by the uh, variety of film agencies that are available in, in the United States. Are there, are there many universities or organizations that collect these kinds of films? Not, not many. I mean, you will find some in some some uh, university libraries, the best collection uh, that I know of in this country is is actually at the National Library of Medicine, which actually has now it has a special film curator, uh, and have had actually for a while, uh, which now preserves historical medical films. The problem with it is that it's actually very expensive to preserve these things. Uh, as I mentioned, most of these films have a relatively short life. So there's sort of a sense that, well, why do we need these films? Of, uh, why should we preserve them when it costs so much? Um, and uh, 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 by, by many libraries. So only a few agencies are really able to do that. The, the, National, the, the National Library of Medicine has a lot. Uh, probably the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress does have have some, um, and then there are a few scattered in in medical school libraries, uh, medical schools, uh, other medical institutions. Um, but so many, the, the vast majority of these types of films, the, the health education films, really get started going in the 19, 1910s in this country, uh, and uh, the vast majority of them no longer exist. But, but, uh, but I was wondering whether such uh, organizations like the University of Rochester's um, his historical um, history section. <laughs> um, that you would have to ask. <laughs> I'm not the answer. Uh, the Eastman. Um, I think Museum, Eastman. Um, I think Eastman may have some that have a, a lot of photography, photographic. Yeah. Historical films. Historical films, yes. Yeah. Historical. It, Eastman was certainly involved in promoting educational films for for uh, health educational and medical training films, um, uh, going back at least to the 1920s. Um, I, but I don't know whether they, 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 they are still preserving those films or not. Um, Any other questions? Yes, behind you, could you just pass the mic? Thank you so much. Um, so I work or worked on the Marshall Plan, which of course is like the same time period and has excessive amount of films, educational, promotional yeah. films come with it. And I know that the Marshall Plan information officers very closely tracked <clears throat> which films were rented out and shown to what kind of audiences. So kind of like the actual audiences actually. Oh, Oh, yes. yeah. actually like bodies and scenes during these films so it sounds like probably your information officers may not have done that work because I was wondering whether from the imagined audience and the eternal coders you could actually get us to the actual audiences <laughs> and, and, and yeah. I, have follow, I have a follow up which yeah. I, I assume that in, in all of these audiences, the audiences actually happen to be mostly white and male, and whether you had at all reflected on what that would mean for the film. Um, um, yeah, it's it's sort of, uh, okay, um, on the uh, question of whether they actually talk to audiences, uh, the only two examples I found were, uh, were Done on a sort of very informal basis, where um, the, uh, the the information of uh, sorry the uh, director of 
cancer control at the NCI basically took a copy of the film down to the local school in Bethesda and showed it there. And um, he was reassured that, it, that, 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 that the students enjoyed the film, though they had some criticisms of it. Um, uh, he, uh, but that, 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 that was about it. They showed it, that, that there is some commentary. They do a series of premieres for the film and there's some sort of commentaries on the response of some of the audiences to that, to, to, to those premieres. But that's really all the evidence that, that I had up to that. And this is a very well-documented film. Um, what you do, of course, have a lot of uh, other, other published responses to this. Um, and I have a lot of information on the internal responses, both within sponsoring agencies and within the age, within other agents, medical medical and medical film agencies that responded to the to uh, to, to to these films. Not all of which were very pretty to to, to read for the filmmakers. Um, your other question was about uh, oh, about the target audience. Uh, but first of all, I I, I, it, I I don't think it was purely aimed at boys. Uh, um, I think they were also aiming at, at, at women too. In fact, most of the scientists, or certainly more than 50%, it would seem to me, uh, in, in, in the film that you see are, are, are women and not, uh, and, and, and not men. Um, and I think they're doing this partly because there's a desperation to recruit women into the field of biology at, at, at this particular time. On the question of, of race, you, you're absolutely right, they're targeting the white middle class middle class audience. So it's, it's really interesting that one of the scientists, I didn't show him up here, is, is actually a South Asian origin. Um, so I, I think what they're trying to do there, though, is, is, is not to, is not necessarily to, uh, to seeing that as a, as a way of targeting, of, of recruiting uh, people uh, from, uh, 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 from South Asia or other parts of the world but to portray research itself as an international enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that they're, 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 they're able to do this. So there's that one scientist who, who is um, a South Asian, that there's another who I assume is Afro-Canadian. Um, and, and, and then there are French speakers who double sort of as, a, 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 as both uh, foreign voices but also as a, a, a as a way of appealing to the French Canadian audience too. I wonder if I could intervene here and suggest we continue the conversation over refreshments because I see that Bob is putting the wine away. So I <laughs> want to get some. This is the time to pass. But I want to thank the speaker and continue the conversation next door. Thank you. Very much. Yeah. You can actually mail it. Yeah.